to the moon. But this type of mining doesn't refer to crypto. No, we are literally going to mine the moon. And that is probably the very first step towards an intergalactic species. Governments, agencies and entrepreneurs are currently having that tea party. Questions in place? Colonizing, excavation, transportation, monetization. Apparently this time, our footprints on the planet will be much bigger than the last time. So in this episode of Blank Note, let's try to follow step by step how the next giant leap for mankind will be accomplished. Anytime humans felt sad or alone, we looked up in the sky and talked to the moon. We found relief. At least, that is what Disney says. A whole new world. Or any culture that ever walked the earth whose evidence we were able to read. But also in the literal form of its reflection of sunlight during night hunt or long sea sails or the study of moon cycle and their influence in water, crops, weather and so on. And apparently even the most cynical generation of humankind can't have their precious phones and laptops and crypto mining without the help of the big white sphere in the sky. Rare earth minerals, by definition, are rare on earth. In fact, nearly 90% of all the metals that go into our electronics come from China, which is estimated can last just about another 15 to 20 other iPhones. And here's the thing, we don't actually know for sure a geological study has revealed that the 15 lanthanides as well as scandium and yttrium are present in abundance underneath our only satellite planet, as well as water and helium-3, a rare element sought for future energy development and nuclear fusion. The Space Resources Roundtable held this month in Colorado talked real plans on how we can achieve moon mining. And there is one key term to be kept in mind from the whole three-day 250 participant meeting. ISRU, Insight to Resource Utilization. A base. That is actually basically what it means. We need a base on the moon. NASA's Artemis plan has a deadline of landing humans on the lunar south pole by the end of 2024. Next step would ideally be the base. Why on the South Pole? That is where ice water is most present in the planet, in the cold freezing bottoms of craters. Also, sunlight is available for large fractions of the lunar day, roughly 28 days long. That makes it more friendly than most places on the moon, that have 14 days of sunlight and 14 days of darkness. So, first we land on the moon. We use water for sustaining life, and then we split it into oxygen to fuel us and hydrogen to fuel the rockets and the machines that will pave the streets, build domes, landing pads and other lunar housing. Now we have only walked on the moon, not run. Here on Earth we can only test models of how the construction site will work, but on the moon's surface we have to deal with electrostatic charges, radiation, lots of dust, a scant vacuum atmosphere and one-sixth of the gravity. Manufacturing the machinery on Earth and then transport them into the Moon is expensive, although necessary. The other alternative would be 3D printing, but we will still need to transport printing materials. Again, nothing is ideal, but a combination of the two would 3D print the bases and some modular structures and probably transport heavy-duty machines. After we figure that out, we need to deal with lunar regolith, the dusty topside of rock and rubble, how we drill it, what we excavate it with. Next up, processing and storage. Most of the machines will have to be run by AI or as less human interaction needed as possible to make it cost efficient. And between the land takeoff pod and the housing processing units should be the containers for the minerals and the gas tanks with either hydrogen for rocket fuel or helium-3, crucial for this year energy breakthrough nuclear fusion. Transportation will require safe cargo landing and safe gas tanks. We really need to master zero mistake landing technique, otherwise we'd literally have a helium bomb falling from the sky. We are going to need cargo ships like SpaceX Falcon Heavy, a whole lot of them, in order to actually make a business out of this mission. And lastly, home sweet home, which will be where exactly? 
Who's entitled to the riches of the galaxy? Finders keepers? According to the 1967 United Nations Outer Space Treaty, no nation can claim ownership of the moon. But space law experts don't believe the treaty can stop private commercial venture. In fact, the last party is a main driving factor in the whole idea. NASA's and US government commercial lunar payload services program commissioned SpaceX, Blue Origin, and many more private companies to offer lunar exploration and transportation services. This kind of funding will bring commercial innovation. What's in for them? Money, of course. The sole way this whole mission can work is by making it a profitable market. So with the right amount of time and innovation, we are heading towards the next golden rush. Not literally, of course. One mine after the other, the search will migrate in other directions too. From south to north, east and west. More jobs, more goods, more services, more experience, more innovation, more planets. Probably Mars. Having a stepping stone closer to shore will definitely help make the now six months long trip to Mars possible. But what will happen to the pale muse of the skies? Will the greed of this ambitious intergalactic wannabe species poison it too? After all, Moon's geology affects not only our tides, but seasons, gravity and every day of our lives. Calculations show that if one metric ton was removed entirely from the Moon each day, it would take us 220 million years to scrape 1% of Moon's mass. But I guess by that time, we either have found another cash cow, or we'll probably be piggybacking another solar system. Or maybe not be around anymore? Who knows? But benefits aside, there are some side effects that we will probably testify in our lifetime. Lunar stakeholding policies. Everybody is entitled to a piece of the moon. So maybe some universal income from that kind of market will be possible. Culture. No more mystery. The tales regarding our dear nightly companion will be less romantic, less inspiring. An overall visual, artificial mind creators will pop up decade after decade. It is clear that humans will expand their resource map. They have to, in that pursuit of innovation. There will be benefits, there will be downsides, there will be sacrifices. We can only strive for the scale to lean on the first one for our own sake. If anything, our experience with Earth has taught us that we reap what we saw. As for these solid space rocks, they have been here before us. They will still be here after. They don't mind. That's it for this video. If you want to see more, I'd suggest hitting the subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. See you in the next one.